My mom was 15 years old when a new boy from school raped her. And it was very brutal and very traumatizing and she didn't say anything to anybody. But then when she found out she was pregnant with me, she said, well, we were in it together. And when she told me that, I was really young, but it stuck with me that she recognized me as a person, even though I was, you know, microscopic, basically. <laughs> She married him because she thought he was going to get better somehow. But after two years of brutality and on the verge of suicide, pregnant again, she called her mom and she said, look, if you don't get me out of here, I'm going to kill myself. But for reasons I'll never fully understand, she still sent us back there to my paternal grandmother's house. And that's where he had access to us. And, um, and so my earliest memories is of sexual abuse. My mom's second marriage was a respite for me when she married we had like this normal life at his house. At my paternal grandmother's house, there was work to be done. The abuse became more deviant and more violent. I'm not sure exactly how old I was, but I stopped going to my paternal grandmother's house. And my mom got a divorce and I was a latchkey kid, which meant that I was home when she was at work or out or whatever, and I took care of my baby sister, and she had other people living there sometimes. So maybe only a month or two months where she had an uncle come and stay, or my grandmother would come and live for a while, or her friend would come. And um, my uncle molested me when I was 13, and I, I, it just kind of flipped a switch for me because I had no safe place anymore. When I was younger, I had my stepfather's house, so there was a safe place there. And then in that situation, I just I just flipped out. I started breaking into houses. I started smashing windows across the street. I kicked out the, the uh, windows at the bus stop. I really didn't understand that I was just trying to get somebody to notice me, even though I had been sworn to silence. In that situation at 13, going crazy like that, I stopped going to school. I was truant all the time. I was smoking a lot of pot, um, drinking a lot. and. This guy came to my neighborhood who was so jovial and so friendly to everybody. He was so magnetic, is the only thing I can think of. All the kids in the neighborhood gravitated to him, and I had no idea that I was his target. It wasn't long before I was sitting in his car to get warm and hanging out with him, and then it wasn't too long after that before I was in his bed. And he would tell me, you know, you can have boots. I didn't have boots. You can have gloves, you can have the things you need if you just sleep with other people too. I'm like, ah, I don't need any of that, now I'm fine. And on my 14th birthday, my mom came home and I said, it's my birthday. And I was very excited because in my 14 year old mind, that was the only moment there was. I wasn't thinking about stealing her wine. I wasn't thinking about throwing her wine glasses across the room. I wasn't thinking about all the times that I had hidden the kids who had run away from detention center under the bed. Like none of that stuff was in my mind, but all of that stuff was what was in her mind. And she was angry. And she opened her pocketbook and she took two crumpled up dollar bills and she threw them on the table and she said, here, as she walked past me. And I was devastated. I had no ability to cope with that at all. In my 14-year-old mind, I was it was my birthday. So I called that man that came to my neighborhood that day. He made me think it was my decision all the time. It'd be up to you, you'd be in charge, you'd be in control, which is not true. He also said that he would protect me. He was a bouncer at an illegal gambling ring. And he'd bring me to that back alley and he'd leave me in the car and men would use me there over and over and over. And then when he opened the door, he said, gee, you look like hell. And he'd give me my money for drugs and he'd drop me off at home. He never protected me. For years, he sold me. It was very brutal. Sometimes I was out on the streets for days at a time, sometimes weeks. Sometimes I would sleep in cars. Um, I went to foster care a few times, but usually I'd just take a shower and maybe sleep the night and then leave. Um, I didn't want to be around kids. I was afraid that I would taint them. In my drifting, I had contact with motorcycle gangs and I went on um, 18 wheelers in all the way to Texas. I used to just stick out my thumb and just go. Um, I had attempted suicide a number of times. Um, living on the streets is very difficult. 
When I was 17 and a half, I was sold to one man as a house pet. I called a house pet. He set up an apartment for me so I would be not on the streets anymore. There would be no more rapes, no more beatings. I felt like even though I knew he was dangerous because he was the one who ran the illegal gambling ring that my first pimp had sold me out of. So I knew he was a criminal, but he also knew people in the government, like the city councilman who had purchased me numerous times. And he took me to a detective's home when he bought me before. Um, he set up the apartment in the name of the candidate for sheriff at the time. So in my mind, I knew he was very dangerous, but I didn't feel like I really had any place else to go. So now I, I thought, well, I can handle this guy. I know I can handle this, this is no problem. And he told me that if I got pregnant, I'd have to have an abortion. Well, I'd been passed around for five years. And as far as I knew, I had not gotten pregnant in five years, day and night. Like, I said, okay, it's not gonna happen. And I got pregnant. And he knew I was pregnant already because when he came home, I told him I was pregnant. He said, yeah, did you make an appointment for the abortion? I said, no. And he said, well, there's the phone. And he stood there over my shoulder until I made the appointment. I had thrown myself at his feet and begged him not to, but he, he would have nothing to do with that. I fell asleep that night. I don't know how, but I had a dream of the abortion procedure in living color from the perspective of the womb. And I woke up and I literally found my hands up in the air and I'm like, God, if you're real, I need you to show up. And I remember the social worker who had been my key tracker when I was a runaway. So she would track me down when I was a runaway and, and try to like get information on where I was and stuff like that. And she was kind. And I called the Department of Health and Human Services and they said she didn't work there anymore. But the woman other, on the other end of the phone could obviously hear how scared I was, my desperation. And she said, let me, let me see if I can get her for you. And I hung up the phone and it, within, it felt like no time at all. We were meeting together and we devised a plan. She would find a home for me, for unwed mothers, and I would have to fake an abortion because he was so connected. I wasn't gonna be able to just leave. He would find me. So she went off and, and tried to find a home for unwed mothers and I put my stuff in storage. And that night when I was supposed to go out um, to dinner with him, I was standing in the apartment, literally shaking from head to toe. And when he came in, he didn't even come all the way into the apartment. He didn't take his coat off. He just said, you're ready? And I, I just grabbed my coat. I didn't know what to think. I didn't know if he had had me followed, if he knew that I didn't go through with the abortion. I, I had no idea, but I, it was just do or die, I had to go. So I went with him, I got in the car. And all the way down to Boston, I told him this big elaborate story about how terrified I was and how painful it was and how I didn't want to do what we were doing anymore. I said, I can't do this anymore. So all through dinner, I pushed my food around. I still didn't know, you know, did he even believe me? And on the way home, almost, almost when we were back in, in Haverhill, he said, all right, I'm gonna let you go. But if you come back to this city, you're mine. And I was so relieved. And I went in the apartment and I looked around and I still didn't really know if I was free or not, but Anthony found me home for unwed mothers. It wasn't really a home either. It was, it was this woman's house who opened up two, room in her, two rooms in her basement. And she took us on her treats and taught us how to forgive. We did the empty chair visualization. So we'd sit across the chair from all of the people who had abused us. She helped us to get on um, public assistance for a short time. And then um, I moved back in with my, my maternal grandmother just before the baby was born. So they were there with me, my mom and my grandmother. And I had the baby and I parented her. And when my baby was two weeks old, I started school. So I had gotten my GED while I was still pregnant. And then I went to nursing school. And while I was in, before I started nursing school, I met my husband.
but he was such a nice guy that I kind of ruined it a lot of times. I told him to go away. He was too good. I sent him away. And um, when I graduated nursing school, I invited him to my graduation, but he didn't come. An old boyfriend came. And even though I hadn't been with anybody, it was our thing to be together, so. I got pregnant that day, and then Mark and I got back together. And I had to tell him I was pregnant and we hadn't been together. It was very crushing for both of us, to say the least. But he said, I mean, I swear within an hour, he said, I'll marry you. And I'm like, no, no. About six months later, I'm big as a house again. And he goes, you know, I'll marry you. And I said, no, no. And then after the baby was born, he came to the hospital and he said, you know, I'll marry you. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm not ready. And he wasn't gonna ask again. So the baby was a couple months old and we were sitting outside and my daughter was running around, my toddler was running around. And um, I just looked at him, I said, why don't you marry me? And he said, okay. <laughs> so we've been married now for 28 years. He adopted the two girls. We have five children, they're all grown, I have two grandchildren. And uh, he's been just wonderful all these years. As I said, I was quite a mess. The first five years, I was a disaster. I would have no idea what was triggering my emotional responses whatsoever. And I would just fly into this rage and I had no idea why. I didn't know that the trauma that I had been through as a teenager was affecting me in my 20s. And I think it's really important for people to know that the child abuse, especially the core violation of child sexual abuse, really does affect kids later in life. I don't even think my trafficker had any idea how traumatic that would be for me. That shame and that guilt took a long time for me to, to get rid of, but one of the things that I did was I would literally take the Word of God and I would stand in front of the mirror and I would say, you are beloved. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are chosen. You are a person that Jesus died for. You're, you're important. I've been out of my trafficking situation now for 34 years. And now I'm able to teach others about trafficking. I have been for a few years. That took a long time and a lot of healing. And when people think about prostitution in terms of it being a consensual thing, I think a lot of times they don't realize that it's it's not a matter of, this is what I want to do, but more a matter of, is there really anything else to do? Do I have another choice? And I think if people are talking about prostitution being legal and consensual, I would say, please don't do it. Violence is inherent in prostitution, and maybe somebody doesn't encounter it in the first few weeks or right away, but it's there. Buyers don't see prostitutes as people worthy of rights. They're implements for their own pleasure, and that's it. Saving my baby saved my life. I'm sure I wouldn't be here. I can't wrap my head around the idea of somebody being a human rights activist that would fight tooth and nail against human trafficking, and yet not the right of a, a baby that cannot possibly in any way speak for themselves. Maybe it's because my mom said, well, we were in it together before the technology was even there for her to see what I looked like. But for me, now we have that technology. We know that there's a baby. We can see the baby. We can see her little hands, her little feet. We can see her heart beating. I mean, there's no question. We have the science. There's a child conceived and from the moment of conception, they're a whole new person, different blood type, different DNA from the mom, and it's not the woman's body anymore. It's a different person. So for me to say, well, I'm against trafficking, but I'm for abortion, I'm like, I, I, I don't get it. They're both human rights violations, and even more so for abortion because that child never has another right again. What about in the case of rape? I was conceived in rape myself, and I'm very grateful to be alive. But in my case, I also conceived 
from years of sexual violence. So I understand the kind of trauma that goes on for someone who's pregnant by a sexual assault. And women who are in that situation need healing, they need guidance, they, they need compassion, but they don't need abortion. And I say that because about 70 to 75% of women who conceive as a result of sexual assault actually preserve the life of their child. And I think that women do that because their rights were violated and they don't want to violate the rights of another. So I'm standing here, sitting here, a trafficking survivor. I was a harlot, I was a prostitute, prostituted person, whatever words you want to use, but now I'm born again, I'm free. God saves. He's real and he saves and he can do it. Whatever it is you need done, he can do it. You need rescuing, he can rescue you. And he can take anyone like, like Rahab, like me. I mean, now no one would ever recognize me as that um, trafficking survivor. No one ever did. I was president of New Hampshire Right to Life and nobody knew. Nobody knew any of that stuff. I'm an entrepreneur, I have real estate, business, and all kinds of other stuff. People wouldn't know. As a nurse, people would never have known. And so, no matter what labels anybody else has for you, like maybe you have a parent who's you know, still saying, you know, you're a slut, you're a whore, you're this, you're that, whatever. And I would say you don't need that term. You can be a child of God. You can be God's holy princess. It, it's just a matter of making that decision and calling out to God, because He shows up. He shows up every time.